Hippodrome Theatre in London's West End is the scene of a typical Hollywood opening night. It is the premiere of Meet the Navy. Composed of Royal Canadian Navy personnel, the show proves such a hit that tickets are as scarce as nylon stockings. Many celebrities are on hand to launch the show on its voyage. The First Lord of the Admiralty and Miss Deborah Kerr, well-known actress, are interviewed by Jerry Wilmot. Jack Hilton, English impresario, makes an appearance. The Honorable and Mrs. Massey and Noel Coward are introduced. Dame Lawton Matthews and critic Beverly Baxter wish the Navy all the best. Ex-film star Colonel Ben Lyon swells the crowd of well-wishers. Now, coming into the Hippodrome Theatre on the opening night, the Lord Mayor of London. I wonder, sir, might we ask you just for a word for our cameras? Yes, certainly. Nothing gives me more pleasure than to send a greeting to the people of Canada and my pleasure at being present on this wonderful occasion when I know I'm going to enjoy a wonderful show put up by the people of Canada. The show opens with a bang and swings into a snappy dance routine which brings down the house. The ensemble dancing elicits a great deal of praise from London's hard-boiled critics. The fast-moving routines are a tonic to the war-torn nerves of London theatre-goers. Following the successful opening, Commander Robertson, CEO of the show, receives the plaudits of the audience. A backstage party gives the visiting celebrities a chance to meet the newcomers to big time show business. A star performance by typical Canadian guys and gals, Meet the Navy makes many friends for the Dominion's senior service. Canadian base near the foot of the Apennines, an urgent message is received. Canadian tanks high on the mountains need supplies. It is the job of the ski troops to deliver the goods. Only sure-footed ski men can scale the snow-clad heights. On the alarm signal, the lads pile out and prepare themselves for the trip. Careful briefing and experienced Italian guides ensure the success of the journey. Even faces are camouflaged with powder. Blending completely with the ground, the ski train is a hard mark for Jerry snipers to hit as they make their way across the snow. The going is plenty tough and demands first class condition. The trip is no pleasure jaunt. Jerry mortars are always there to emphasize the point. A patrol pins the enemy down with fire while the main body detours along another path. needed supplies arrive at the tank position on the mountain peak. Welcome indeed are the ski men who have traversed miles of difficult trails to bring food and ammo. A spot of tea tastes like nectar after the perilous trip. With the supplies comes the mail. Letters from home are doubly appreciated on outpost stations. Combining a job of rugged trailblazing and plain tough fighting, the ski train fills an important role in the carving up of Kesselring. An ideal way to keep Canadian soldiers fighting fit is training for boxing matches. In Ottawa, Joe Lewis, the brown bomber, 
referee is a boxing card at the Uplands Training School. In the first bout, Private Garcia represents the Army and Sergeant Roy Jones, the RCAF. The fighting goes to the Army all the way. Keeping up a steady one-two, Garcia keeps Jones on the defensive. No doubt in anybody's mind as to who's the winner. It's Private Garcia. The heavyweight champ is presented with a token of the boys' appreciation by Upland CO. 3,000 miles away at Satogan Boss, the divisional boxing finals get underway. The light heavyweight match is between Sergeant Niccolo of Montreal and Private Andre. Niccolo has lots of stuff on the leather and shows his superiority from the opening bell. No knockout is scored, but Niccolo gets the judge's nod. The middleweight bout between Sergeant Nyberg and Trooper Wagner gets off to a flying start. The bicycles are dragged out early in the fight and get plenty of use. They call them category swings. If one connects, you are on the boat back to Canada. Early in the second round, Nyberg smashes his way in for the kill. A clean knockout ends conclusively the ambitions of Trooper Wagner. With friends and fists, Canucks are slugging ahead to victory. Field Marshal Montgomery, accompanied by General Pirar, arrive on what was German soil to present awards to Canadian soldiers. Against the pictorial background of the Reichswald Forest, the colorful ceremony takes place. While in nearby positions, guns blast away at the enemy, various decorations are presented for deeds of valor. ceremony marks the first investiture on German territory. Maybe the second one will be in Berlin. A pile of ruins is all that remains of the once important German base of Cleves. Aerial bombing and artillery fire have taken their toll. The cathedral, or Stiftkirche, is demolished. It was built in the 18th century from funds contributed by 80 families. Damaged in 1820 during an uprising, it is finished off in 1945 when used as an enemy sniper's nest. Its three foot thick walls built of brick and concrete provided Jerry with plenty of protection. Now, its wreckage is carted away by Canadian engineers to use as the foundation for hastily constructed roads. The old-fashioned corduroy road comes into its own to beat the low country mud. Heavy vehicles must be kept moving forward. The engineers turn woodsmen to make it possible. Thanks to the road makers, lorries are able to drive right up to the main depot of the amphibious ducks. Here, supplies are transferred for their trip by water to Canadian forward posts. German civilians stream to the Allied rear for protection as our infantry moves up to the attack. Squadrons of Spitfires provide an air umbrella for the force of tanks converging on the Rhine, the last major obstacle before Berlin and victory. Mm -hmm. 